Thank you so much, everyone, for coming here. We'll have a few more people coming in, I'm sure. Um, I'm Melody Birkins. I'm the Associate Director of the Dickey Center and a proud alum of the Dartmouth uh, Graduate Program of Earth Sciences. Um, and my path was Earth Sciences from here and then moving off into the policy world. And so it's really wonderful to be back here now at the Dickey Center to marry science and policy with an incredible uh, speaker you're going to have today who I have actually followed throughout my career a little, a little bit. I mentioned in my class that I've always been about five or <coughs> 10 years behind watching what Vaughn did and then trying to, to move into that space as well. So you have someone here today to talk to you about the future of science and technology and sustainability of the planet um, who's really at the forefront of thinking about this work and being engaged in this work. Um, I first met him back when I was looking into sustainability issues. He was leading a center for sustainability at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, then I next had to, uh, was thinking about these issues of science and diplomacy and, well, who's leading the center, who's the chief international officer and then leading the Center for Science and Diplomacy at the American Association of Advanced for Science? Well, that'd be Vaughn. So I picked up the phone again, um, started moving into, well, how do we really make this a real idea out there in, in, in the world that science and technology and policy and diplomacy can all come together? Vaughn is putting out a journal called Science and Diplomacy to try to mainstream the ideas. So, and now he's at the National Academies leading up science, technology, and sustainability programs um, for policy and global affairs at, at, at the highest level after serving as a science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State, um, Perry, and then for Tillerson briefly before moving to the National Academies. And he's going to be, so not only giving us the state of where we are today, but what I was really enjoying in my class today when he spoke and in all of our conversations today, what's next? Where is all this leading and how can we be part of it? How can our students be part of it? Um, so I've let you know, he's the Senior Director right now of Science, Technology, and Sustainability at the Policy and Global Affairs Division of the National Academies. Before this, he was the Science Advisor, Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State at the Department of State. Um, before that, uh, well, he, he actually grew up as, uh, as in the world of atmospheric chemistry with policy experience, and he was, um, uh, I, I said most of this, so I'm jumping ahead on his, his bio, sorry. Uh, before he did all the things I mentioned, he worked at the State Department as a special assistant and advisor to the Undersecretary for Global Affairs from 2002 to 2006 on issues related to sustainable development. So way, again, before all of this was in the news today, he was working on it at very high levels. Uh, he also served as a program director for the Committee on Global Change Research at the National Research Council way back in 2000 where he was the study director for a White House report on climate change science. He came from the same world that I, I, I mentioned, is geology and geophysics. Um, he graduated from Yale with a geology and geophysics degree, as well as one in international studies, recognizing early on that he wanted to marry those ideas, something I only came to later. Um, and then he did his master's and PhD at the University of Virginia, where he focused on the transport of chemistry and chemistry of atmospheric aerosols into marine environments. So not only does he have this incredible vision of where the future of science and technology policy and diplomacy are going to go. He has a very strong grounding in uh, you know, the science that, uh, and, and technology that we all uh, learn in deep on our PhD, but then we actually move on to applying these ideas from science and technology into the space of policy and diplomacy. And again, we have one of the people who's taking this to a new level, and I'm very interested to hear, since I'm very interested in the future of sustainability of our planet, the future of our policy and diplomacy, um, to hear what he has to say to us today. Please welcome Dr. Von Trier. Thank you, Melody. I, I, I always appreciate when somebody says, way back in 2000. That's always a, <laughs> it's a feel good. No, thank you. It's, it's, uh, thank you. It, it's really great to come to Dartmouth and to have a chance to speak at this august institution. I, I will admit, Melody, when you first invited me, um, I was a little bit hesitant because oops, the, the, the news of the day, I think, when you invited me actually was this. <laughs> and, and as a Yaley, it really made me think twice about coming up here. Uh, alas, just, just weeks later, um, sorry, just, yeah, this, that, that order would be restored to the universe, and I felt, I felt very comfortable coming up here. So I know that whenever somebody from Washington comes to New Hampshire in, in an even number year, the burning question in your mind is, is, is he testing the waters for 2020? 
And, and, and let me just, just, just be clear. Um, I'm going to put all the rumors to rest. I am not and will not be a candidate for president. <laughs> so with that out of the way, I'd really welcome the opportunity to speak to you more about things that I am thinking about a lot, which is really thinking about what the issues are that have big implications for how we think about government and how we think about the role of science and technology in a sustainable planet. And critically, and a lot of what I'll talk about also, is that relationship to science diplomacy. Because I think that's one of the things that, that is really, really a big passion of mine. But I will admit that I, while I've had a great passion for science, and particularly actually the geosciences, for many years and at a young age, my true passion and calling very early on was actually to be a baseball player. But this guy got in the way. For those that don't know Derek Jeter, he decided that he wanted to play shortstop for the Yankees right around the same time I would have been playing shortstop for the Yankees. So I had to begin to think about a plan B. And this was my plan B, was to go to graduate school. And, and I really did, as Melody mentioned, just love that idea of connecting to that idea of the earth sciences and learning more about the amazing processes of how, how the world interacts and how you can learn about, by taking measurements, understanding something about the earth system that's affected by humans, that's got natural pulses and timing to it, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But just in general, I just, I just fell in love with it. It was something that actually was part of my progeny, I, or I was progeny of this. I, I had a, a father who was also in a similar field and just had that real sort of draw towards just understanding the earth. But as Melody mentioned, I also had a lot of other interests, and one of them was this connection to understanding international policy. And I was very fortunate that actually both of those things came together even when I was an undergraduate. Because what I realized when I was both doing an international studies major and a geochemistry degree where I was doing some work on radioisotopes was in fact things like this, the Adams for Peace Conference, were based. This is the highest level policy. It, things that have big implications for the way that the world is going to survive over the next decades were built and needed to have a connection to the scientific community. And having worked on now, at this time, when I was doing international studies piece, working on issues around radionuclides, and also working on things like the International Atomic Energy Agency and its role in the Nonproliferation Treaty as an international studies major, I really learned that firm grasp that you actually, taking worlds and colliding them, actually is really important to be able to translate and put things into context. And that was something that I, sort of throughout, I've been very interested in doing. While I was in graduate school, one of the big ways that this came and drove home to me was actually, I think, my, my second or third year in graduate school was when Mario Molina, uh, Sherry Rowland, and Paul Crutzen won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And they won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the first time as somebody doing environmental chemistry. They were looking at the mechanisms and the methodologies for how the chlorofluorocarbons, how chlorine was actually destroying the ozone layer. And right there, again, I was in the, sort of in the middle of my graduate career. I, some of these people, actually Sherry Rowland, I, I had known for, for some time because he and my father were, were contemporaries. But Sherry, and, and I knew a little bit of Mario Molina because he actually gave a talk at, at UVA when I was there. But that conversation to learn about that role that science had in helping understand really one of the wicked problems. Years later, I had an opportunity to meet with um, Ambassador John Negroponte. And those that know uh, Ambassador Negroponte, he was, he was a long-term foreign service officer at the State Department, multi-term ambassador, um, and had been the UN and other things. But at the time of the discussion around the Montreal Protocol, which he describes here is really this idea that scientists from NASA and NOAA came together and worked with the diplomats, worked together with the diplomats to put in place probably what still is, I would say, the most successful environmental and maybe arguably one of the most successful treaties to exist in a multilateral scale. And the amazing thing about it was it was based upon the basic knowledge that came from the scientific community helping understand a mechanism. How is it that certain chemicals that we use in everyday life as propellants in cans, spray cans, how was that connected to the problem and the challenge of ozone destruction, which was in the stratospheric ozone destruction, which is also being observed. That link to say that had a direct line from the scientist to the, to the policymaker because you had to understand what the problem was. And then you had to figure out what you could do about that problem. 
and to bring that up to the highest levels of politics, the highest levels of international. Oh, and oh, by the way, this treaty took place and was negotiated and finalized during the height, well, not the height, but during a very serious time in the Cold War, that we were actually able to use the science to make that argument, even at a time when the geopolitics were a little bit tricky. But it was called science diplomacy. I mean, in fact, in fact, Ambassador Benedict, who was the chief US negotiator for that, actually, he does, if you ever listen to Ambassador Benedict or read his book, uh, Ozone Diplomacy, it is one of the great stories of a career diplomat negotiating this issue of ozone destructing and, and, and uh, Montreal Protocol. And it's just he the way he talks about it, the way the sort of the color he gives, even the conversations that he had with the Reagan White House in finalizing the agreement to go forward with something that I think a lot of people would say, it is interesting that it happened not only during the Cold War that brought in the Soviets and the Americans to this international agreement, but it also happened during the height of, of a more conservative Republican administration that they went forward and put together this environmental treaty then the terminology was just thrown around. It was science diplomacy. We were seeing, actually, the height of science diplomacy. But it's not, science diplomacy isn't new. We've heard about it. For those, I mean, I'm, for those that go back to the peace treaty between the Hittites and the Egyptians, you know, even then, as they were beginning to build trust between the two kingdoms, there was a message sent from Hatsuli to Ramses, which in Ramses had, had the, the height of the medical. Hey, can you help? Send your experts. This was, and if you know anything about this, this treaty, this is the one that both sides of the treaty, the first one, where both versions of the treaty are actually still, um, uh, still in existence. You can actually see both of the sides, how they viewed the treaty in, in, in their writing. Um, so it's one of the earliest written treaties that exist. But there it is. Technical experts were sent, or a technical expert was sent to go and help build trust, to build the relationship between two warring societies. But even going back to the more contemporary days, the Foreign Office in the UK was not created until 1782 when the Royal Society, the British Royal Society, actually had a foreign secretary charged with building relationships internationally back in the 1720s, so predating the time period. That use of science and that utilization of international science to build out and to connect bridges, even when before the uh, actual, you saw the diplomacy officially taking place at an official level. In the United States, I mean, Benjamin Franklin, you can't, you can't think about sort of the, the early years of this, of this country without looking at the role that Benjamin Franklin had in building the connection with the French during the time of the Enlightenment. And why was ben Benjamin Franklin was an enlightened person? He was sent to France to secure support from the French against the British. Well, I mean, as it turns out, the, Fr the French hated the British. They would have done it anyway. But you sent over somebody that was of a, of a learned character, somebody who could sit in the court and actually hold conversation as an intellectual to convince that not only were these Americans you know, beating up the country you hated, which is a plus, but also there was some intellectual underpinning to that. They weren't just a bunch of axe-wielding you know, frontiersmen just throwing around axes. That there was, a, there was an intellectual grounding to it. And Franklin was a perfect person for that conversation. If you look at Thomas Jefferson, who was the first Secretary of State, you know, in, a, anyway, in, in, anyway you look at it, he, he had built into him not only as the diploma, diplomat part to him, but critically viewed himself actually pri almost primarily as an agrarian, an agricultural scientist and did a lot of thinking around that space as well. So this continues on. I, I, the organization where I work now was, was actually charged very early on in its founding to begin during World War I to take advantage of the fact that scientists interacting among allies could do an important job of building those relationships that would be necessary, that the scientific enterprise was placed into and critically part of the efforts to build this relationship even early on. And then this, I don't know if any, you probably know this, you know IASA. So, I mean, here, these are the, the Soviet and the American leaders in the late 60s beginning to create negotiations to say, look, we might hate each other for lots of other reasons, but we've got to find the scaffolding of things to work on. And science seemed to be a pretty good place to start. And so they built this institution called the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis to bring together 
the East and the Western scientists to look at complex systems, to look at some of the wicked complex problems like environment, like energy, ecosystems, and eco economics, that that was a safe place. And in fact, maybe a, a profitable place for the world to work together, even when the other politics of the situation were very difficult. So now we're in this new era of science diplomacy. And the new era of science diplomacy actually is driven by sort of three key events. One is, in the United States, was 9-11 in the, in, the in the second Iraq war. I'm going to go through some of these. The second one was actually the ending of the Cold War. And the, the timing, I mean, the, because of the continuity of history here, they actually overlap a lot. And then the third one, which is the one where I'll really focus in on, which has to do with a lot with sustainability, is this whole output of that and other things, which lead to this increased globalization. And the role that science and scientists and technology and technologists are playing in that space at all different scales. So in 2007, a colleague of mine, Kristen Lord, who is a political scientist, um, who actually now runs an organization called IREX, which does a lot of uh, international exchanges. I'm sure you've interacted with them, Melody. But one of the things that we looked at, we both come out of the State Department during a time where the US view, particularly among Muslim-majority countries, was pretty much at a low point. That the Gulf War, the second Gulf War, was creating a lot of tension, a lot of other problems. But there was polling, and not only was it Zogby, actually, if you looked at there's Pew polling, other polling was saying, look, even as this region has real problems with the US and US policy, across the board, US science and technology has a very high standing and is very respected. And so we looked at it and wrote a paper in science that said, as you're beginning to look at different policy options, don't forget the valuable role, and we look back at the historical stuff I mentioned as well, didn't go all the way back to, to Ramsey's, but look at the historical world, that by bringing the scientific communities together, you can actually maybe identify ways that you can actually build a productive, forward-leaning agenda, even as the, all the other politics of the region are gonna take time and have some difficulty. So Zogby's polling and Pew polling showed this is an opportunity for countries to begin to engage. Not long after that, and, and Melody mentioned science and diplomacy, which, which is a journal we started to begin to get and look at some of the key issues, the intellectual foundations of science diplomacy. But we started a center, and when I was at AAAS, called the Center for Science Diplomacy, which was exactly this. How do we bring together all of the different communities? And I'll, I'll talk about some of the stuff we did in that. But to begin to look at the role that science can play and scientists can play in building some of these bridges. The UK Royal Society actually put together a whole report bringing together world leaders, and in the scientific and political space to say, what does the new frontiers of science diplomacy look like? And like I mentioned, we, we produced a journal. And, and I'll say the journal's now been around for about five years. And the amazing thing is, what, what's, what's remarkable is this is the speed with which other countries have picked up on science diplomacy as being their advantage. My, one of my very good colleagues is the chief science advisor to the government of New Zealand. And, they are all in with their new prime minister particularly. They are all in on science as a way for a small, as he says, a small country that's very far away to have relevance in the world by getting their scientists sitting at the table at the UN climate change negotiations because they know more about greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and mitigation. That gives them a relevance. You go down and we have great conversations with colleagues of ours from East Africa. They're using science and science exchanges and education exchanges as a way to build an East African community. It's a growing trend that you're just seeing. You know, I know VS and I have a good friend, Romain Morenzi, who is from Rwanda. He was using science to be able to manage the gorilla species with Uganda and Congo because you know, they could fight about everything, but they had to get the, if they get the data correct, they could work together on this very valuable commodity, which are these gorillas and the tourists that come with it. But then, you know, with the, with the advent of the Obama administration, one of the things that was interesting was that this idea of, of the theory of science diplomacy was actually put to practice. And President Obama, when he first went to Cairo, very, I mean, it's now, the, the, you know, it was 2009, it was within five months of becoming president. The first thing he did was he said, you know, we need to rethink, you know, that, the polling that was showing, oh my God, we need to rethink the, the, the relationships and where the positive, he went to, to, to uh, Cairo, to develop a new vision, a new version of the way that the US would engage with Muslim majority countries. Embedded in that speech, and in fact, one could argue the only part that actually was implemented from that speech at its grand scale, 
was the scientific endeavors, bringing more scientists, having science envoys. We created this whole cadre in the State Department of science envoys, senior level US scientists that went out to parts of the world that maybe the view of the United States was not so high to build those collaborative relationships and to build some sort of foundation. There was new centers around specific topics, whether it's water or energy, that were created with the US engaging with Muslim majority countries at first, but then actually broadening it out more as part of a global engagement piece. Oops. I actually remember, because when I first came into the State Department, I, I was looking at like, the role of science in the State Department. And I remember talking to, to Secretary Powell. I actually had this great opportunity to meet with Secretary Powell. And first of all, he was, so he's like, oh, you're a geoscientist. I was a geoscientist too. And then he continued, I goes, the best thing I ever did for geosciences was I left it and went to the Army. So that was always his contribution. So when, when he'd see me, he'd be like, oh, a real geologist, uh, not me. But, but it was, it was this idea that we have to think about the fact that more and more science was becoming and is becoming part of 21st century policymaking. And so this was actually codified fairly early on in the, in the 2000s. Actually, Madeleine Albright was the one that pushed for this, saying the complex issues that the world is facing right now in the post-Cold War period are going to require that the foreign ministry, the foreign ministry of the United States, the State Department, think differently about what it does. And so she asked the National Academy of Sciences to look at what the role was of science and technology for the Department of State. The Academy came out with many different recommendations. In fact, what was interesting was they found that almost every top line priority of the Department of State for the foreign ministry, whether it was climate change or tuna negotiations or economic commodities, any had underpinning them science and technology. The Arctic, any one of these things had science technology embedded into US foreign policy priorities. And that the, you needed to actually have a focal point for science technology at a high level in the government to be able to engage. And so the creation of the position of the science technology advisor started with Norman Newrider, who's top left, continued to George Atkinson, went down to Nina Fedorov, then Bill Colglazier, and then I just was it. I was the fifth science advisor to the Secretary of State. So to started with Secretary Kerry and stayed on for a few months with uh, Secretary Tillerson, but really saw firsthand the role of having a senior level person who had direct access to the senior leadership of the department to be able to elevate and to communicate the different issues around science and technology that were actually affecting our foreign policy. What was interesting is, and this is a little secret, by the time it's changed a lot now, but in, in 2016, the State Department actually had over 300 PhD scientists and engineers working in it at any given time. It's a department of 30,000 people, so percentages are low. But, but the fact is, this was a tremendous cadre of people working across, not just on the environment side, but uh, nuclear proliferation, all these different issues. It was, it, was a, it was remarkable. But science was actually, and I love this because, because I was a little, had a little bit of involvement with this when I was actually not in government. I don't know if you can see the, the title for this. But given the world that we live in today, I mean, Olympics notwithstanding, the conversations taking place between North Koreans and Westerners overall has not been one where it's looking for areas of cooperation. It's actually been maybe the opposite. And, and I told the class earlier today about my own experience in 2009 going to North Korea. I'm happy to talk about that later. But, but what happened is, and this is this remarkable thing, that this was a geoscientist and a volcanologist actually from the UK meeting with a bunch of seismologists and volcanologists from well, both China and from North Korea to look at this mountain, Mount Pektu, which sits on the border of China and North Korea and has actually, if you follow the Kim family, you know that they, of course, were born out of the mountain and came down. So it's a very holy mountain for them. But it also is a very seismically active uh, mountain actually that has a long history of actually been and fairly significant I think within the last thousand years of placing large amounts of ash on what would now be the capitals of both China and Japan in large quantities. So understanding that volcano actually has some very serious implications. So being able to bring together the scientific communities to focus on a problem, problem based, has led to a collaboration between British American and and North Korean scientists in this upper sort of northeastern or sort of northwestern corner of North Korea. And also led to a paper in 
um, a research article in seismology in the journal Science. I will guarantee you that this is the only time that the journal Science has had a first, a first authored paper from a North Korean. This is a different thing. This is, a, this is a science. It's, it's, it's about this. This, I don't know if anyone, I'll sort of go on to this Cuba piece. I, I, I got to know this guy, Alan Roebuck, quite well. And he is an atmospheric chemist from Rutgers. And over time, he got very involved in looking at transport of aerosols and the implication of these aerosols on radiative forcings. You know, a lot of the conversation that took place actually during the Cold War was around nuclear winter. He was very early on involved in some of that conversation around nuclear winter because of the dust kick up. Well, he was invited down to Cuba because one of his former students was actually doing their degree in meteorology, was a the degree in meteorology at Rutgers, was of Cuban, um, was Cuban, and actually had come up to the United States in the 70s when there was a little bit of an initial rapprochement. And what he did was he, this student, went on to become the head of the meteorological side of Cuba and invite him down, invite his old professor down, not old professor, his young professor, his wonderful professor, but his former professor down to give a talk. And Fidel Castro shows up because he was getting very interested in this question of nuclear weapons. And if you saw that he had some New York Times articles later on that were talking about the nuclear proliferation and why we have to ban all nuclear weapons, part of it was driven by this. But I actually had the opportunity very often, I've been to Cuba a number of times as part of the science diplomacy piece, looking at environmental uh, areas of environmental cooperation. Alan came on some of this. We went to the Hotel Nacional. Has anyone been to Cuba? Does anyone stay at the Hotel Nacional? Did you see it drove by? I mean, it's, I mean this is the iconic structure. Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's, I mean, it's remarkable. And I mean, this is where what it was, what Sinatra had, had one of his honeymoons there. Um, it was a famous, and, and, it, and the sister hotel to it is the Breakers. In, and so it was this iconic structure. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's sort of falling apart, but it's this beautiful, I mean, it's just gorgeous. It sits up there, and then, you know, obviously, it's the full feel. And I was there, and, and very early on, so this must have been 2000, sorry, I date everything by pre my daughter and post my daughter. So 2008, so it's pre my daughter. Um, it's a, well, right, because then it closed down. So it closed down, for, and so there were not, like, in fact, U.S. government officials, I was not in the government at the time, were not allowed there at any high level. So actually, as we're seeing, they're walking around the Hotel Nacional, I see these folks, and they're speaking English, and they're speaking, I go up to them, I say, hey, you know, what gives? What are you, you know, where are you, where are you from? You just sort of hear boondoggling it? They're like, no, we're actually from the FAA. I said, oh, I know government people can come down, well, we're down here because... You know, we're just starting to have conversations with the Cubans about opening up more airspace. And they said, we're the techies. We're the geeky techies. We're the engineers. We're the sort of the people looking at flight operations. We're the, we're the technical crowd. We're the, you know, the... So sure enough, we go there. And we're having this conversation. Oh, well, that's nice. Techies are able to go down there. They're having technical co-op, nothing political. So then we're getting on the airplane to leave. And the airplane, when you fly from Cuba at that time, and I, not anymore, but it's all charter flights. None of it, none of it is actually, none of it at the time was actually, you couldn't get on a, an airline, you something like this. So you get on a charter flight, leave Cuba, we're walking, getting on the airplane, so the charter had us and the, the flight controllers um, in the back. And we get on the plane, we're taking off, and as we take off, I mean, if, if you've gone, you know, you basically to get to Cuba or from Cuba to Miami, you go up and down. There's, it's, it's 90 miles. I mean, it's if they had the Dartmouth shuttle, I mean, it would have been three hours still. Um, but, but it was this amazing um, experience where you just go up and down. So we're getting on the airplane, we're taking off. As we're taking off, the, we're leaving Cuban airspace almost immediately, and the pilot gets on and says, we're now, leaving, we're now leaving Cuban airspace. To the flight controllers in the back, your colleagues from um, air traffic control Havana just wanted to say thank you for your wonderful visit. They look forward to reciprocating and going to Miami to teach you how to really dance the salsa. And so it was this like this bizarre, you're being transferred from one air traffic control to the next. You're getting, and these are the techies. They're talking about flight operations. They're talking about how to use weather data, all the different things. And well, then in 2016, probably one of my favorite moments at the State Department was I was sitting there in the Cuba office, which actually was right next to my office. And we're sitting down there as President Obama is flying into Cuba as the first American president 
to come to the island. And this is the picture of Air Force One landing. And all I could think is wouldn't it be poetic history if those air traffic controllers that had been talking 10 years earlier were the ones guiding that airplane in to, to, to Savannah? Anyway, but what's not as well known is in fact, well, what is well known is one of the things that opened up very quickly, which there had not been, was direct mail service. And direct mail service between the United States and Cuba had actually stopped. And so after, uh, right before the Obama, Obama, President Obama's visit, they had reopened up this, this service. And the first thing that went on that, on that plane, the first letter that got delivered, and here it is being delivered here, was a letter from President Obama to this abuela in, in Cuba who had become his pen pal or written a couple of letters. What's less known in the history, and this is one again one of my favorite experiences, having having well, having very much helped this take place, was that the other thing that we got on that same flight, and you know it wasn't as much reported in the New York Times, was a bunch of science magazines got sent to the Cuban Academy of Sciences. That again, that opening of, and that's from Rush Holt, who is then the now is the CEO of AAAS, the first packages from Cuba to the United, I mean, from the United States to Cuba included a letter from the president that was to the abuela and issues of science. Now we're getting to this other piece, and this is where I think we're going to see the world going. And this is where a lot of the role of science and technology, and particularly as we think about long-term sustainability, is going to be a key driver. First of all is every element of the world right now around science and technology is becoming globalized. It's not a surprise that it's in foreign affairs is saying, hi, robot. And if you look at where they're going with things. Gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9, the implications for that around environment, around security, around economy, all these different ag agriculture. And then what I was saying to the class today is something that I think we all, and that VS and I were actually having this conversation. Look, the most valuable commodity there is right now is your data. I mean, we are all just shedding data at a level. And the impl international implications of that are enormous. And they're really valuable to get more and more of the scientific community involved in that. But also increased globalization has brought us to try to better understand the commonality of the planet we all live on. And that commonality of the planet we all live on was you had the Montreal Protocol, which I alluded to earlier, that sort of started some of this conversation around around building big environmental treaties. But clearly, you had the World Climate Summit in Paris that led to the Paris Agreement. And at the same time, the Sustainable Development Goals, same year, 2015. And you know, this was all based on data, right? This is Jim Hansen. He's talking in 1987. Look, you know, climate change or global warming has started. The Montreal Protocol, I was at State Department when this was being sort of formulated, not the, not the, not the Montreal Protocol, but actually something that was really critical called the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, looking at getting whole new ban uh, bans and other replacements to some of the CFCs that have huge global warming potential, the HFCs. And there was, there was Secretary Kerry deeply engaged in that conversation. The IPCC itself is an example of international science diplomacy to meet an environmental challenge. You know, here it is, it won, you know, the winner of the, not the Nobel Chemistry Prize, the Nobel Prize in Peace. Why? Because it brought together to try to get a common understanding of the science and the impacts of that science on the way that the world can think about policy. And here, 193 countries come together at the UN in 2000, September 2015 to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm going to talk about in some detail. Um, not too much detail, don't worry. Um, to talk about with this, this is 193 world leaders came together and said, yes, we're going to talk about something called Sustainable Development and the Goals. And here they are. And for those of you that, that are <laughs> steeped in Sustainable Development Goals, like I have been for the last little bit, you know, there's 17 of them. And they cover almost everything. This is in some ways, an ambitious, a very broad roadmap for the next 12 years until 2030 for the types of things. And they, they gave them nice little titles underneath them. There, there's 17 goals, 169 targets. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it goes on and on. It goes on and on. But it covers people, prosperity, partnerships, you know, economy, social dynamics, environment, it's all these things are how they interact with each other. And I'll get to that in a second, too. I had the honor of being, when I was in government, with 
well, it's not with my colleague, but I was the chair or the co-chair with the Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations of something called that we came out of the Sustainable Development Goals, which was the Science, Technology, and Innovation Forum. How do you bring science, technology, and innovation to meet the Sustainable Development Goals? That became codified and is now still probably the most important aspect of implementation of the SDGs. I got to, 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 to co-chair this with the Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations, Macharia Kamau, who's now left and become the foreign minister of Kenya. Um, and there's Ban Ki-moon, who's Secretary General. I mean, this was at the highest level of the UN. How do we bring science into this conversation? How do we get scientists and engineers and technologists and innovators to think about 17 goals? Well, one of the goals, and this is not it, was, was when Secretary Kerry, and, and this is sort of towards the end of my time at State Department, Secretary Kerry loved ocean. That was his thing. He loved it. And I just got to get this one right, because I just, this was... You know, one of the things that he got very involved in was how to think about ocean space and ocean issues, and he really led a lot of the conversation about oceans. And so one of the things very early on that he committed to as secretary was, was to bring together the world leaders to get commitments. And so like the SDGs are built around getting not top down, but bottom up, building commitments by getting private sector and academic sector to do research. And governments to do all these things, to bring that into this whole fold. And the ocean climate, or the ocean summits that Kerry did were a huge part of this. And this is when we hosted it. But before this, I mean, he comes, he decides his big idea. Secretary of State has a big idea. Yeah, it's a big idea, sure, fine. We'll deal with this, a big idea. I want to, he comes, I want to teach a class on ocean to a high school. Okay, we'll figure what that looks like. We've been contours that, well, make it, so it comes, it comes to me. It comes to, we, I want to teach a high school class on ocean science, climate change, ocean, uh, marine productivity in, in, in the ocean, uh, pollutants, and also uh, acidification of the ocean. Here we go. And, then, and not only that, I've got all my friends. All my friends are all these other foreign ministers from all these places. I want them to teach a class too. So you're kind of like, okay, we're going to get you prepared. We're going to find a classroom. We're going to find some school kids to, to teach. So, well, the school we find turns out to be Montgomery Blair High School. Montgomery Blair High School in, in Maryland is just, had just won the Science Bowl. And we said, oh, we got this thing. I tell a staff person, oh, we got this school. And the staff person goes, comes back and says, no, these kids are actually going to know their stuff. <laughs> we're like, yeah, it's a science class. What do you want? So anyway, so we go, OK, well, we're going to do this. We're going to put together this thing. And he's got all of his other foreign minister friends also teaching a class someplace on ocean. So I get a phone call on Thursday, and, and, and the event is actually on a Wednesday, the following Wednesday, and in between is Memorial Day. Secretary Kerry tells the chief staff, tell them, tell the science folks, I want binders of stuff. I need to be prepared. These kids are going to know their stuff. I want binders on, on this, and this is all relate to me by his chief of staff. He wants binders of science articles. And I get, and I hear, and you know, <laughs> John, he goes, you know, not, not the, what do you guys call them, summaries or something? I say abstracts. He goes, yeah, not those. We don't have, he wants the whole thing. And real science papers, not the, not fact sheets, science papers. Real science. So, of course, we sit there and we're like, okay, here's these four areas. We're spending our time pulling our hair out, going, okay, we've got to get the secretary the three binders of all the science stuff for him to basically, you know, use to prop open the door. Sure enough, we could together get to go to G Journal of Geophysical Research and go to Science, go to Nature, go to uh, Proceedings of Natural Academy Sciences, get these fantastic articles across these different things. Hand to get there, that's like finishing up your midterms. You're like, get it in right before, and like, you're like, it's Miller time. Anyway, so hand it in, and that's Friday, and he's off for his long weekend. Secretary Kerry comes back on Tuesday morning, usually at senior staff meetings on Monday, but because the long weekend's Tuesday. He comes in, sort of bouncing his step, and around the table, in the senior staff meeting is, you know, secretary sits here, you know, deputy secretary sits, and all the senior undersecretaries sit here, and they're all in charge of, you know, Europe and Asia. I mean, you know, the, and, you know the, the, the other people, senior staff, sit around the edge. And that's what comes in, he's got these two binders. He goes, folks, I spent all weekend, he's got this, puts in, he goes, I spent all weekend reading these binders. This is great stuff in here. I commend this to ev everyone should get copies of this. And these guys are just looking around, and they're like, yeah, <laughs> putting their feet down, just hoping he doesn't hand it to one of them. Sure. 
Anyway, so it goes off, and we actually bring in Marsha McNutt, who's the president of National Academy of Sciences, to sort of help back him up on some of the science issues around, around this. But he goes to Montgomery Blair, and he gives this remarkable talk and answers questions and teaches classes. And I would say probably got 99.9% .9 of the stuff right on, on the science of the oceans. And the kids were engaged. And it was this idea of why, and it gets to this whole question, why is the secretary, when there's all this stuff going on, why is he focused on the ocean? Why is it? Well, because what he was looking at was saying, it's the, it's, you, get, you can, A, you can chew gum and walk at the same time, but that you have so many things to worry about, but you can't forget about the long-term stuff. And bringing in the knowledge that we're gaining over and over again was part of the long-term stuff. I, I show this because I'll tell you, when you're the science advisor to the Secretary of State and you get a picture of the Secretary of State standing in front of the periodic chart, <laughs> you take it, you hold it, you grab it, you embrace it, and you show it to every single person. The Secretary cares about science, right? There you go. That's no story of that one. Anyway, one of the things we did when I was there was actually realizing that things like the sustainable development goals, those 17 goals that are going to be underpinned by science that are part of the foreign policy apparatus of not just you know, the United States, but more critically, other countries which are critically using them as a, as a way to identify paths for their own policy. We said, look, there right now, there was a science advisor to the Secretary of State. That was, that was me. Three other countries had it at the time. The Japanese had created the position, the UK had the position, and New Zealand had the position. And we said, there's a great little network of us. But other countries, particularly developing countries, particularly countries that need to be able to access the scientific information, would benefit by having somebody whose role was to serve as a science advisor to their foreign minister. And so we created this network, this Foreign Minister Science Technology Advisors Network, FEMSTAN. And in it, there are now about 14, 15 countries that have designated people who have the job to bring more science advice to their foreign ministers. The top thing that we work on and I'm, I'm still involved with it even though I'm gone because I served as a, as a secretariat to it, are things like the Sustainable Development Goals. How do we get countries to talk to each other even around issues that are not always the top, top, top of the foreign policy but have foreign policy implications? How do you bring the scientific community in the foreign ministries together to think about things like that? But it's not just that the, I mean, the, the most important thing that I've seen happen in the last decade and maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, maybe it's just a natural the progression, is that global issues are no longer the domain of the nation state. More and more what we are seeing across all realms of things, whether it's climate change or sustainability or any topic, is that oftentimes, A, the expertise, but oftentimes the will and the motivation exists outside of the national governments. Marsha uh, McNutt just came, when she came in to be the president of the National Academy of Sciences, very early on, last year actually, when she gave her address to the, to the other members of the National Academy of Science, said, look, right now at a time when it looks like the US is, is looking to withdraw from many of these international agreements, the National Academy of Sciences views it as our, not only, not only opportunity, but obligation to make sure that the science community from the United States, the science, engineering, and medical communities stays engaged in these conversations. This is, I mean, a huge piece. We, we've, we're gonna continue to work with our international partners, but this is at the sub-national level. This is, I mean, we're, you know, we're not a government agency. For those that don't know, I mean, the National Academy of Sciences was actually started in 1863 um, when, when uh, Abraham Lincoln signed a charter to bring it into, to bring it into existence to provide non-governmental advice to government when called upon. But Anise Parker, I don't know if we come across her, she's the mayor, well, former mayor, sorry, former mayor of, of Houston. And I got to know her fairly well, and actually was with her last week, and when she said, said, look, mayors relate the global to the local, but you better get the local right. Now, this was a part of our conversation. She's saying, look, Houston has to think about what it's doing, and every other place does. Even in the Paris Agreement, I had the opportunity to go out to California, to Los Angeles in September of 2015 and serve as the State Department uh, representative to a summit that their then, or now current mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, hosted with his counterparts from China that was looking at the China, U.S.-China Climate Leaders Summit, which is all based upon one premise, that it can't just be the top down, the, the, the foreign ministries of the two countries talking about climate change. It has to be the cities. 
It has to be the states. It has to be the municipalities where the action really is. What changes? What policy options? What knowledge uh, can they exchange with one another? This was, you know, and, uh, Mayor Garcetti just committed Los Angeles to meeting the sustainable development goals. This is, so the sustainable development goals, which were sitting there as 193 countries having this conversation, was actually now switched to, to saying it's not just the federal level. It's got to come down to the level. Look at, I mean, Dartmouth isn't part of this one, but, but just last week, the University Climate Change Coalition. These are a bunch of universities and state universities with, with large footprints. Others also, and also with Mexico and, and Canada involved as part of NAFTA. They're all committing to climate change action. Lots of universities have committed to take specific action in sustainability and climate change. These are, like I said, this is no longer just the domain of federal systems, cities, universities, um, all levels. In fact, for those, let's see if this actually works here. For those that remember, like, watched, look, this is, let's see if I can do it. Oh, no. Amazing. Like, well, not only amazing, this thing, I think this is the gift part of it. Let's see here. How do I make this thing? Yeah, whoops. How do I make this thing play? <laughs> here. Anyway, well, I don't know, you all, you've all seen it. There's nothing, but this is, you know, this is, <laughs> I am using an ad blocker. Um, did you ever watch that, those, those rockets land? I mean, I've taken a lot of physics classes. I can tell you thrust to weight ratios and all that. If you sat me in a room for seven years, I would not figure out how to get those things to go like that. You know what I do? Is I take a picture of a rocket going like this and run it backwards and be like, there, did it. Look, here it is. But it was just, yeah, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, <laughs> see, you would trust someone like me to land a rocket. I can't even turn on a PowerPoint. But, but that said, it's just, it's just amazing, right? And that's happening at a level of, of the private sector. The private sector is engaging in the types of research that was traditionally the domains of, of national systems. But also, if you think about it, they are also where they're looking at things like issues around sustainability. I talked, we could just go to the, just to the next slide. Um, you know, you talk to, to now, most, most big companies now have chief sustainability officers. Their job is to look, because it makes sense financially for them, right? There's a financial piece to it. But I talked to the, one of the chief, sustainability, the chief sustainability officer for Nike. I mean, I see that Nike is one of the uh, sponsors for, I guess, Dartmouth Athletics, because I see everyone's walking around with their, their backpacks with the Nike swoosh. But they're looking at it because they want to reduce the supply chain of materials. Here, I think, you know what, I think. Yeah, I think I just, there we go. With the clicker there? Nice. There, whoop, who knows what I did. Oh, you did it, okay. Yeah. So, uh, now here, I'll pull that. There we go, okay. Anyway, so here's some big questions I sort of think about, and then I'm gonna end with just a very quick story. So one of the things is, how do we think about, the big questions that we're thinking about in sustainability, and this is the, this is the topic, of, is one, how do we scale global priorities to the local manifestation? You've got to, all these things, whether it's climate change or sustainability, these are big global conversations. But we've got to scale that down to the local. And you're seeing that more and more, as you've seen in the last few things. There's also a whole question around frozen knowledge. And I know here at Dartmouth, you're thinking about this from, from indigenous knowledge. In other words, around the world, a big challenge is there are, there's innovation taking place everywhere. If you go to Rwanda and you see what's being done in some of the agricultural areas to actually increase agricultural productivity, it's at a scale which is small but has relevance if you went to Burundi or went to Tanzania. The problem is it's often frozen in these villages. How do we take that knowledge that exists in these local scales, the knowledge and innovation, particularly the innovation, these creative innovations that are actually much more relevant to their neighbors than is some big USAID funded project coming in and saying, do this. How do we unfreeze that knowledge and connect that knowledge to other areas like that? And finally, how do we link, and this here, I come back to the SDGs. Look, the SDGs are 17 political goals. I've been in the United Nations negotiations. Many of you have been in there. You know how it happens. Like Everyone sort of throws in enough until they kind of can feel like they've gotten their stuff there. But sustainability is the white light. What we're looking at when we talk about sustainability is just general long-term 
human well-being and prosperity the long, for the long term. You throw it through the prism of politics, it's going to come out with 17 colors. The big challenge is now how do we connect 17 goals that are fairly disparate, that don't have good metrics to them, but connect them so that policies to try to meet this are coherent and cogent in a way that then, when integrated and aggregated, comes back to the ultimate goal, which is sustainability. Not the goal, which is 17 disparate things that somebody says, I'm going to go meet water, even if it means destroying the ability to have you know, prosperity or gender equity. I mean, you've got to look at how they interact with each other. Jeez. So I have a huge passion, as you can tell, about the scientific enterprise and the role of the international scientific enterprise. Let me finish just for two minutes on, on wh why this is local for me. So my son, Chip, was born in 2012 in December with something called transposition of the great arteries. So what he basically had was he had a situation where his two main arteries, his artery that connects to his lung and the artery that connects to the aorta, were switched. So he's a blue baby. Right? So he did had two non-interconnected circuits. So the, his blood was not being oxygenated. So he was born, and he was a blue baby very fast. It turned blue. It was the global scientific enterprise and the history of the global scientific enterprise and the sharing of knowledge over generations that gave him his positive outcome. At the end of the story, it's good news. He's alive. He's driving us crazy. Um, <laughs> it was this woman, initially. Here's a woman, um, Sepeda Motsuzami. She was a neonatologist in the, in, the, in the hospital when Chip was born. She was there for a totally different reason. But she was there be, in the metaphysical way. She was born in Iran, had been trained in the UK, and had come to Washington. The global science enterprise had brought her to Washington, D.C. The, the desire to do research, actually, at Georgetown. Part of that. She recognized very quickly that Chip was not turning pink like he should have. He was actually going gray to blue. And, intervened very quickly. If she hadn't, dead. Said, nope, it's not a breathing problem. It's a, it's a circulation problem. The surgeon that did his open heart surgery six days later, that opened his chest up, took the two arteries, flipped them back, and then connected. I don't even know how they did this. This, this is like rocket landing for me. Um, connected his coronary arteries back together. I mean, he's six days old, so you know, the heart was this big, so the coronary arteries were small. Connected, did that switch. Switch those arteries back and forth, connect, reconnect them. Is a guy who's Australian who did this training in New Zealand before coming to Washington, D.C. Again, the Global Science Enterprise. The actual discovery of Chip's condition was basic research. It was done by this guy, Bailey, who was, who was actually a Scotsman who was serving as the medical advisor to the King of England, or the King of, the, the King of England. And was sitting there and was seeing these children were dropping dead. They were blue. They weren't thriving. They were dying at very young ages. And so the basic research question was why? What is going on here? So he was a pathologist, actually. He was opening up these dead kids and seeing what was going on. He's the one that discovered some of the congenital heart conditions that only today can we solve. It was not to solve the problem. It was to understand the problem in the first place. And here's the guy, Bill Mustard. He, Dr. Mustard is a Canadian. He was the first one to propose an approach to actually begin to get towards that solution, where you could change the arteries in such a way to keep the children that were now had two these two disconnected systems connected. And then the current surgery, the, the, the gold standard for surgery, was done by this guy, Dr. Jatin, who is a Brazilian who came to Brazil from Lebanon. This is the global science enterprise, getting to solutions that actually affect people, I mean, affect this person. And we are the beneficiaries of this, oftentimes in the United States, because we've attracted some of the top talent. We've tapped into some of the talent that exists and have been able to bring that knowledge through generations for outcomes. So when we talk about long-term sustainability of a planet, what we are ultimately talking about is how do we capture the science and technology and innovation needs for the way that we can bring that science, technology, and innovation to meeting challenges at all the different scales. At a local scale where we exist here, to regional scales where there's lots of interactions, to global scales where so many of these problems will manifest themselves in many different ways. I'm sorry I went longer than I should have, but thank you very much. I really appreciate it.
Absolutely, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, as a strange character, I'm a strange character who's a political scientist who studies the relevance of biology to human behavior. And I'm sorry to bring you some very sobering news. It's a real problem. Because in my field of political science, it's considered bizarre to be interested in biology. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I mean, I've been working on heavy metal uh, toxicity and behavior, and mm -hmm. most recently on carbon dioxide emissions and global warming. For instance, the, the issue of global warming, people say, oh, it's the temperature is, is, is up and down. You don't talk about the melting of the sea, sea ice mm -hmm. over the North Pole where 300,000 square miles of ice is melted. Yep. <laughs> you, know, you don't talk about rising sea levels in you know, Miami and Houston. No. The social scientists are largely still in the 18th century, and they are opposed to what you're doing. I mean, I've actually been subject to discipline because somebody in my department compared, complained about what I was doing after I retired. Hmm. And I want to know how you can actually change social scientists who don't like what you're doing because they think they don't understand it and they just don't like it. So First of all, thank you for the question. It's it's. Let me. I'll take it from a, a slightly different example, which has some relevance. So that merging. So I remember my father used to say that his job was to knock an idea down, but leave just enough to let somebody else come along later and knock that idea down. And and at the heart of it is this idea that there's always an orthodoxy, and you have to challenge the orthodoxy. And it's really hard. I mean, I'm not saying that you haven't. I'm saying that the, the merging of science and diplomacy for a long time was viewed as two communities that actually not only, by, by the way, by both communities. Diplomats would look at scientists and say, what do you know? You've never lived in the world of having to deal with this degree. And scientists would say, oh, we, you know, we're scientists. We, we have all the answers. One of the things that changed over time, and I don't know if it, it still needs to change a little bit more, is is trying to bring those communities together at least not when, not when you needed them to be together, but when they didn't need to be together and so that they just got to learn from each other. And the example is the AAAS Policy Fellowship. AAAS, for the last, what, 40 years, has brought scientists into Congress, into the State Department, into other places, not because they're looking to say, the scientists are going to come in and solve your problem. But because they were looking at it and saying, you know, if we just bring this group together, they actually learn from each other a little bit. And I would say, I think for both of us, that our assumptions of what policymakers were thinking and what they were not connected to versus the reality was actually changed. It changed, it, I, it changed my mind more than it maybe even changed some of the policy. I, I learned more from those people I interacted with than they ever learned from me. I think in... Your question is actually a deeper question because I think it gets to two groups that have been thinking about the domains of their, of their academic pursuits so long. And one of the things that we've been chatting about is there's now this merger of the International Council for Scientific Unions and the International Social Science, what is it, ISSC, to try to make one meta organization that looks across the board. And to be blunt, nobody knows whether it's going to work for exactly the reason you said. Can these two communities coexist in a way that allows them to feel that one isn't taking advantage of the other, isn't trying to dominate the other, isn't trying to, to pull away and say something that is making the other feel irrelevant? And I don't know. I mean, it's, I mean, the, the, it's, it's like any relationship. I don't know. It's, it's, it's so hard because it's like you, you, it's, it's tricky, right? It's something simple to do, and it changed my life. Have a social scientist and a scientist teach a course yes. together. That it's a great idea. Really, is the most important thing. Yeah, to do. I agree. That cool looking, you know, I give that the, there was a there's a historian, Gaddis Smith at Yale. He and my father actually taught a course together on global climate change and historical implications of it. And it was I mean, this was many years ago, but it was it was exactly that point that they they and the students actually saw. Actually, my favorite story was not that. It was, there is 
a macroeconomist named Bill Nordhaus, very well known in climate change and environment. I don't know if you know Bill Nordhaus. And there's a paleogeologist named Richard Alley, probably the most, one of the most famous paleogeologists. And they were sitting on a committee together at the National Academy of Sciences to do a report on abrupt climate change. This is back when there was that, that movie came out, uh, for a day after tomorrow, or whatever it was, abrupt climate change. And so they're, they're sitting there co-chairing this National Academy of Sciences review of abrupt climate change. Well, my goodness, you want to, the most fun thing to do is sit there and watch a macroeconomist and a paleogeologist talk about what the word abrupt meant. <laughs> I mean, you've got Richard Alley going, this could happen in 100 years. And Nordhaus is looking at him going, one quarter. Maybe, <laughs> maybe one business cycle. <laughs> but, it, but, but your point is, the result was they actually both had to round off what they meant by that and frame it in a way that they could understand now I'm talking about geological time scale. Now I'm talking about economic time scale. And how do those two worlds come into each other? So, so teaching a course, getting more of that cross fertilization is great. It also leads to, I think, much more innovative research because you're actually bringing in all the different perspectives. <laughs> Sorry, yes. <yeah. laughs> I think we have a. a, a so this is sort of more a, a comment, maybe also a question. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in your slide about how do you unfreeze frozen knowledge, I wasn't sure at first what you meant by frozen knowledge, but then as I heard you talk about it, I immediately thought of a case that I that I use in my course, uh, environment and society mm. colon towards sustainability question mark. Um, um, and uh, it's a really interesting case uh, that was started by uh, a, sign, um, a farmer at a very local scale in Mali changing a very simple farming practice that ended up leading to re-greening accidentally of his farm during a period of major drought. This was then noticed by NASA scientists. Um, actually, I think it was noticed by some scientists who were looking at NASA uh, satellite photos mm -hmm. and saw that there had been this green regreening of the Sahel over a 40 year period that up till that point quote Western scientists hadn't noticed and then they went to the they went basically to those areas and started talking to people interviewing to find out what happened and they documented that his practice change was just so simple and had such a dramatic effect that very pretty quickly other farmers just began to copy him and it spread. When I went to the climate uh, treaty talks in Paris and first walked into that big giant hall where there were all those booths, I, the very first booth I encountered was for this organization called the B Great Green Wall Initiative, which yeah, is a coalition of yeah. all these African countries all across the Sahel. And it turned out when I looked into it that it was partly inspired by that regreening that spread over such a long Air, large area started by this farmer. Now, obviously, that's sort of one of the better stories, and we have lots of other cases where things from the bottom up don't work out quite like that. But I guess I'm wondering, what are your thoughts, um, especially when you sit in a position like at the State Department? It seems to me that there are times when maybe what's more important is for us to get out of the way. Um, or, you know, if, if we're representatives of science from ex an extremely powerful country like the United States, is our role maybe more to help facilitate networking, but still essentially get out of the way. In other words, it may not be that that kind of knowledge has to really come down from a global scale. That, from so global that's, level. that's exactly, so and I, I didn't do a, a, <clears throat> a graph of it, but it's exactly that challenge, I think. That oftentimes, in a lot of development work, it, it is the transfer is oftentimes discovery. And, and, and by the way, it's not, this is not, a, say it's not a good thing to do this too. But it's a lot of discovery and the movement of things from knowledge. You go through some sort of a, a, a mediator or moderator like the UN system that then tries to downscale it to a local condition. And that, that model works in some ways. I mean, you've seen these things for a lot of innovations and other pieces. To now here. And I use the example of Rwanda because the one I, I, I know quite well for, for a few different reasons. The challenge is, how do you get this barrier here? 
which is something is happening here that is new knowledge creation, new innovation creation, new approaches, like you're saying, a small tweak someplace that has been happening that is more relevant to Burundi down to itself, but isn't going to come back through this system. It's got to go through this system here. And so what are the different ways? And so a colleague of ours, and I keep calling to VS, because is, is now, he's this guy, Romain Morenzi, who's, who runs something called the, um, it used to be called the Third World Academy of Sciences, and it's the TWAS. And that's one of their focal areas, saying how do they unfreeze the knowledge creation that's existing primarily in Africa, which is because that's where TWAS's focus is, to take examples in even at the small, the subscale of a farmer that won't publish that paper someplace, isn't going to put that into the literature, is just doing it. How do you translate that knowledge creation into a place like you were saying, which actually has much more relevance to either same sort of climate conditions, same type of soil conditions, same type of genetic distributions of things, all the different things that actually have more commonality and also social structures that are more relevant. How do you translate that without it being looked at as what you're saying is just, it's got to come from the UN system top down? Because I don't think that's, there's going to be things that are going to have that piece, but what are the mechanisms to even get this conversation going better? And I, I actually, I don't, I, I have no idea what the answer is. I, there, there are attempts to do it. There are, there are attempts to do it through things like developing more, um, I mean, the, one example is to try to think about can you create some version of, of an agricultural extension service for certain, for, for certain domains that would make sense that actually is much more place-based that allows for that transmission of knowledge, knowledge to practice, practice to knowledge at a smaller scale. And, and that's what, what, what models have worked without having to go back through this cycle here, which is going to be, uh, anyway. Do you have any opinions on the current administration's treatment of science and perception of science? Um, I'm just kind of curious. You said that there was a big difference between now and 2016. Um, so I was curious about your opinion on that. Yeah. So the fo the focus is clearly different, right? I mean, that's I mean, that's even if you look, you know, budget. Do you always look at budget documents with a little bit of a a little bit of a sort of a, a gimlet eye on them because you they don't they don't necessarily reflect what the reality is going to be. They're often political documents, right? They're 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 nobody expects a budget to actually be adopted whole cloth. In this case, the budgets aren't even being looked at in many ways. The Congress is sort of taking them and pushing them off and sort of doing their own thing on budget. But they do tell you at least where the perceived priority is. And that base is based upon where money is going. So they say, you know, you want to know your priority? Follow your money. Your money is your priority. That's where, you know, you spend more money on, you know, coffee than on food, well, you're, there's a priority. You know that that priority looks like. Um, and right now, it's pretty clear that, and, and it's been said, I think Mick Mulvaney said it actually in his first budget release last year, climate change is not a priority for, they can't, I think the words, I'm, I can't go to an American taxpayer and tell them to pay for climate change research. So there are certain things that, that I think are not a priority that have been articulated. I think things in the environment space are part of that, part of that view that that's not even a priority for the research agenda, let alone then get the regulatory agenda just down here. But, but even from a research standpoint, that's not the priority. Where there's money that's going is much more to things like security and defense. And you just, I mean, that's, AAAS does a great job of just following where the money goes. Now, what's interesting is at the same time, philanthropies and universities themselves have picked up the funding for certain things, and particularly in some of these places that have been, I don't want to say orphaned, but at least not as robustly done. Now, that's the research agenda. There's a whole other priority agenda, which is saying, how much is that becoming a policy priority to move forward on? And that, I think, is pretty clear. This administration has a very different set of policy priorities around things like climate change, around things like um, environmental regulation than did the last administration. And they're probably, 
I, 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 if you sort of looked at sort of a, a continuum of the Bush administration to the Obama administration, you know, they are even outside of that realm where they would be on that. They'd be on this side of it. I, and, and the thing is, I, I, I think one of the one of the things that that if you don't if you don't live in Washington or haven't been around a lot, which 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 is not as one of the challenges when you don't have political leadership in agencies at a sufficiently high level, a lot of decisions don't get made, and a lot of new things don't start up. So, uh, if you look at the level of undersecretary tends to be the most important, the highest level political person in a government that still has knows the substance of an issue. Right? Once you get beyond an undersecretary, you go up to a deputy secretary who's really more about managing the, the, the bureaucracy and managing the system. And then you have a secretary who's really a political person. Their job is to keep that political face of the agency. And they, they have priorities, but they're often that level of undersecretary, and especially in technical agencies, where they are making decisions about budget allocations, where they are doing things to get new initiatives going. When those slots are not filled, and they, most of them are not, well, many of them are not filled right now, you don't actually have that political person who speaks for the administration, but has a line responsibility to push agendas. And that's where a lot, I think you're seeing a lot of this coming up. When you don't have a science advisor to the president, whether or not that person is going to be, it, it, there are two different models. John Holdren, who I, I, I know quite well, was really, truly a science advisor to the president. He had President Obama's ear. He was in meetings with President Obama. Jack Marburger was not that to President Bush, but he was an authoritative person around making sure the federal bureaucracy of science was operating and actually did a very good job of keeping the agencies coordinated. That actually, they're two different, I mean, again, they're two different extremes in terms of maybe connectivity to the president. But when you don't have somebody even in either of those positions, you're not getting that political level of person who's got that responsibility for the federal agencies to think about what they're doing. Well, thank you very, very much, Juan, for taking questions and also for. Um, emphasizing again the importance of the science, technology, policy, diplomacy nexus and um, what I'm teaching to my students here and I'm hoping catches on that that is actually an incredible future mm -hmm. as, as a decision maker and especially when potentially there are political spaces that aren't being filled, there's a real opportunity to do things in the business world, in the policy world, in the, in the NGO world, in the academic world and that all of us on shared goals, um, be it a social scientist, natural scientist, physical scientist, um, we all have a role in engaging in our civic life and being part of moving forward to a better space and world. And so that's kind of what I'm hoping my students get. And I've been really happy to have a former science advisor to the Secretary of State explain that as well. Thank you for everyone. Thank you.